Good morning, Abby. It's Monday, and welcome back to the Monster High reread. So, you may have noticed that we're not on my bed anymore, because my phone has no storage, <laughs> and it's a problem, but that's not relevant right now. And you know what? We've got the book right here, and I'm right here, and Frankie and Claudine are right here, so like, screw it, let's just go. This is normally the time where I'm like, if you remember last time, but what even happened last time? Frankie went to the spa and accidentally caused a blackout with her electricity powers. What happened melody-wise? Oh, she made out with Deuce to get back at Cleo for making out with Jackson. And that that's that's all that happened. We met an array of side characters, and that's that's all that happened. Chapter 11 is a melody chapter, and it's titled Eyes on the Prize, Especially with Guys. Ooh. Melody's parents are about to go camping, except camping for them is just like a tent. Cashmere pajamas. Who has the money? And like Korean takeout and a uh, projector loaded with season one of Lost. Who has the time to put season one of Lost on a goddamn projector? Who has the time? But yeah, Melody's like, yeah, my parents are stupid and this does not count as camping. <laughs> Melody's mom is like, are you sure you don't want to come fake camping with us? And Melody's like, nah. And uh, Candace is about to leave on a date, so Melody is going to be alone in her house watching her favorite show, The Biggest Loser, except it's not on TV and not about weight loss. It's about a girl named Melody whose crush on an unpredictable curdy, I wish they would stop using that word, finds her alone on a Saturday night staring at his bedroom window. So, uh, loneliness. So Candace's catchphrase is the phrase Candace out. She says it, like, whenever she enters or exits a room and, like, <laughs> low key, I want her. I want one time for her to come out as like bi or just like generally queer and then just be like, Mom, Dad, I'm bi. Candace out. And then she just walks out. Because <laughs> she's Candace out of the closet. <laughs> Candace explains that she's just going on a date with the with the guy she's going with because she wants to make uh, someone else jealous, which, you know, that's that's great. And then her dad comes out and is like, now go up back, back upstairs and finish getting dressed. And uh, Candace complains that it's too hot to wear another layer, and she's like, I didn't even have to use my diffuser. And then she, like, has, like, super bouncy curls, so it's just hot in their house is what they're saying. The furnace guy is coming on Wednesday. Bo wiped his tanned forehead. Now change or I'm going to stick that tent over your body and you can make Jason jealous of that. <laughs> Candace manages to steal more clothes from her mom because remember Candace does that. She's a great person. And uh, then Melody mentions that she like she supposedly doesn't want to like go after Jackson anymore but also she's sitting and staring out the window so like hun you in denial headlights streaked across the log walls of the room my b-list chariot awaits <laughs> my b-list chariot Candace is basically like Melody you should try like dressing up and being cute or whatever and then she leaves Melody lay on the canopy bed, tossing a white satin- Oh, I should clarify, in this scene, they're in Candace's room, not Melody's. Melody lay on the canopy bed, tossing a white satin pillow into the air and trying to catch it before it landed on her face. <laughs> Was this really her new life? I think we've all done that at least once, tossed the pillow up in the air while pondering, uh, the- the something. <laughs> My brain just crashed and I could not think of a word to complete that sentence and honestly, we're just gonna go with it. <laughs> Once Candace leaves, Melody gets bored so she decides to just try on uh, the dress Candace was wearing before just for fun. And then she gets a call from Becca. Ooh, it names the song that's playing in the background. That means I have to listen to it again, guys. Hold on, let me go get my phone. The song Becca has chosen to listen to is... Uh, Freak by someone named Estelle. So, uh, let's go.
This would be a very hard song to have a phone call while it's playing in the background. I would not be able to pay attention if this was playing in the background. I can barely, like, pay attention to myself talking. It's funky, though. The little, like, what, what in the background is making it hard for me to hear the actual, like, melody line. Ooh, I like this chorus. Yeah, I can't hear any of the melody because her screaming in the background just makes it impossible for me to hear anything. <laughs> I really like the chorus, though. I will say that. I like the beat. These lyrics are getting graphic. I should have assumed since it was called Freak. <laughs> okay. It, like, it wasn't bad, but like, it's not something I'm going to voluntarily search out. Like, Jack Johnson's hope. I. I dropped my phone on the floor. Jack Johnson's Hope, that's something that I would legitimately look up and listen to on my own. That song wasn't necessarily my jam, but I don't think it's objectively bad, so it's, it's alright. Melody is still looking despondently at Jackson's house or whatever. And then she says to Becca, I thought you were and Brett were hanging out. What happened to sneaking into the new saw at the Cineplex? And then, uh, Apparently Becca's family, or her parents, wanted her to stay home because of the whole monster thing. Oh! We find out that, uh, Haley transcribes all of Becca's calls for the the book, you know, Back in Better Than Ever, the story of Becca Madden's return to popularity after one girl whose name I won't mention, Cleo, hit Brent, then got hit by Becca and basically told the entire school that Becca was violent and should be avoided at all costs. Why do I have that memorized? I didn't intentionally go out of my way to memorize it. I literally just, right now, I was like, it would be funny if I would manage to get through the entire title of Becca's fake book, and then I did it, so. Be concerned. Melody asks Becca for some more information about the whole monster thing. There are all kinds of rumors floating around, but I go with Brett's story because he's super into this stuff. He says that there are families of monsters that live in Hell's Canyon, about 200 miles from here. They drink and bathe in Snake River and feed in the Seven Devils Mountains. In the summer, the canyon gets so hot they migrate west to the ocean, traveling only at night or on super foggy mornings. Then when fall comes and things cool off, they go back, so it makes perfect sense that there is a sighting because it's peak migration season. Now obviously we know that this is all incorrect. But I thought it was funny that, like, it has to be in Hell's Canyon and the Seven Devils Mountains, like, it, when in reality they're living on, to, it, their street is literally called Radcliffe Way, they're just living on a completely normal street. <laughs> the topic of conversation turns to the whole deal with Deuce and Cleo and Jackson. And Melody is talking about him, and she's like, I totally fell for the shy artisting, he's not even that cute. Thanks a lot, said a boy's voice. Uh, yes, they just did the traditional talk about someone and then find out they're standing right behind you thing. They they did it. They did it. They did it, guys. They did it. They they they, they done did it. Melody turns around and Jackson is there. Uh, it's it's not immediately explained why he is in her house, so you know, tad creepy. Uh, she hangs up on Becca, and then Jackson asks, "Was that, was that Deuce?" basking in the warmth of his jealousy, Melody decided to let him think it was. But the problem is, literally on the last page, she was saying, I wish I hadn't kissed Deuce because it made things so much more complicated between me and him and Cleo. So, like, do do you do you want things to be simple or do you want them to be complicated, Melody? Like, ma make up your mind. What are you doing here? The homeless couple camping in your backyard let me in. <laughs> And, like, it doesn't say that he said that sarcastically or anything, so I'm assuming that the subtext is just supposed to be that Melody understands it, but I also low-key 
wish that Jackson actually believes that there's hobos in Melody's backyard that just have access to her house. <laughs> Melody asks if he was eavesdropping on her call, and he doesn't answer the question. Uh, and then Melody was sitting in the dark previously, but Jackson turns on the light, and then Melody remembers that she's wearing Candace's dress, so she's not just in sweatpants anymore. Oh my god! Um, so he stammered, wiping his slick forehead. I just came you to- I- I bet- <laughs> I just came to tell you to stay away from Deuce. Why? Melody grinned vengefully. Because you're jealous? No, he took off his glasses and rubbed his eyes. Because he's dangerous. Jealous, jealous, jealous. Melody sang like a little girl at a playground. <laughs> Melody's petty sometimes. So in addition to putting on Candace's dress, Melody also put on Candace's like booty shoe things. Uh, Jackson says, is it always so hot in here? And then Melody says, yep, there's a fan in my room, but you probably just came to give me that message. So she clomped over to Candace's door and held it open for him with all of the grace that, with all of the grace of a giraffe on roller skates. Probably me too if I ever tried to walk in heels. Jackson leaves Candace's room, so Melody's in this weird state where she's like, dang it, I should have actually said more to him, I kind of wanted him to stay. And then in the next room she hears, much better, and then she goes in and Jackson's just in her room with the fan blowing on him. <laughs> also, the phrase, much better, is triggering the musical theater nerd in me, because right before I started filming this video, I listened to the song So Much Better from Legally Blonde, the musical, which is the best song in that musical. It's even better than Gay or European, Do Not Fight Me. Melody describes what Jackson is wearing as not important, so I'm not going to read all of it to you, but she notes that he's wearing black Converse, just like hers. Oh my god, they both wear Converse. They're so not like other boys and girls, guys. So what's with you and Cleo? Melody blurted as if her thoughts had been greased with cooking oil. What do you mean? He closed his eyes and leaned closer to the fan. Seriously? Melody's heart revved all over again. Look, I know you're a player. That's fine. I get it. The best we can hope for is a neighborly report, so you might as well be honest with me. Who? What 15-year-old girl uses the word report? Rapport? Report? I don't even know how to pronounce it, and I'm a nerd. I should know how to pronounce words. <laughs> Melody tries to question him about the thing with Cleo, and Jackson just straight up doesn't remember, and he's, like, looking at her, like, tell me, tell me what happened, and he's, like, he looks so genuine that Melody just kind of, she feels like she has to believe him. So she says, Cleo, she said flatly, searching his face for any subtle sign of recognition. But there was none. No clenched jaw, no twitching eyelid, no lick of dry lips. He stared at her with the innocence of a child gazing at his teacher during story time. You kissed her, Melody continued. A lot. This time he lowered his head in shame. Aha, so you do remember. He shook his head from side to side. No, I don't. That's the problem. What? Melody sat down to beside him and mo removed her heels. This conversation was going somewhere silver booties didn't belong. It, this reminds me of, like, on, like, the Jerry Springer show or the Maury show when the women are getting ready to fight so they take off their heels. I have blackouts, he admitted, peeling a loose piece of rubber off the toe of his sneaker. My mom thinks anxiety may trigger them, but she's not sure. What did the doctors say? No one knows for sure. Wait, something doesn't make sense. Melody shifted to face him, but it was impossible to sit cross-legged at a micromania. Hold on, she said, reaching for a box marked comfy. She lifted out a pair of wrinkled, striped pajama bottoms and slipped them on under her dress. How would you- how would you put them on in front of Jackson without, like, exposing yourself? I don't feel like that's physical. I feel like slipping them on under your dress is significantly harder than you're implying when you just brush over it like that. Melody's like, uh, I'm sorry, how can you kiss people when you're all blacked out like that? And Jackson says he genuinely has no idea. No idea at all. He has no explanation for her. Melody's like, oh, there are, like, doctors who can help or whatever. But Jackson's like, I'm more worried about my mom than me. Touched by his selflessness, Melody leaned closer. Her black hair got swept up by the breeze of the fan and whipped to the sides of their faces. It was pure Hollywood cheese. This entire book is pure Hollywood cheese. You can't, like, just call it out now and then not call it out every other goddamn time it happens. So literally, this is all the explanation Melody needs to drop all of her angst about Jackson. Like, all of a sudden. Like, there's no- I would get it if there was, like, conflict where she was like, 
oh, I look into his eyes and I can tell that he's not lying. I must believe him. But, like, they don't even have that. Melody literally just goes from, like, as soon, he literally says, I have no idea how I'm kissing people when I'm blacked out. And then she just, like, she's just like, okay, that makes sense. He literally doesn't question it at all. And they're suddenly just acting like normal friends again. It's very strange. Jackson says, uh, your name, it suits you. And Melody's like, uh, I'll just read from the text. I'm going to stop trying to summarize things. Your name, Jackson said, it suits you. Really? She asked, surprised. Even though she used to sing, she'd always thought she should have been named something darker, like Meredith or Helena. Melody sounds so chipper, and I'm so not. Yeah, but look at the meaning. He crossed his legs so their knees were touching. A sequence of single notes that, when combined, makes something amazing. And that's you. Melody giggled nervously, then looked at her calloused bare feet. Candace was right. Would it kill her to get a pedicure every once in a while? <laughs> I get that when you're in uh, awkward situations, your mind does tend to wander like this, but I just feel bad for Jackson because he's, like, trying to be, like, really adorable and romantic, and Melody's just like, hmm... I should I should go to the salon and get the get this toe situation figured out. No one ever put that much thought into my name, she Melody admitted. Not even my parents. They wanted to name me Melanie, but my mom had some crazy sinus infection while she was giving birth. So when it came time to tell the nurse what to write on the birth certificate, Melanie sounded like Melody. They didn't catch the mistake until it arrived in the mail three months later, so they just decided to go with it. Well, it suits you perfectly. It's really pretty, he swallowed. Here comes, don't say it, please don't say it, please don't, like you. Crap, I was afraid you were going to say that. <laughs> this is, this is so totally not the reaction you want from a girl when you tell her that she's pretty. <laughs> Melody stood, bracing herself for the inevitable. What? Jackson stood too and followed her to the box marked Beverly Hells. <laughs> Look, she shoved her old school ID under his nose. Jackson adjusted his glasses and then examined the card. What? Look how ugly I was until my plastic surgeon father fixed my face, she shouted like her frustration was his fault, which it kind of was. He would told her she was pretty. He would started it. <laughs> I'm sorry, but if you're, if you're, this, I don't want to use the word trigger and in like a non-psychology context, but this kind of does fit. If someone triggers like in like a sore point for you, it's not automatically their fault. Like you can't blame other people for your reactions to things. I get that your reactions can be kind of uncontrollable if you have certain experiences, but like, it's, it's, you just can't, you can't blame other people for that. Like, it's just not a healthy way to look about things. You weren't ugly at all, he insisted. You looked the exact same. Well, then you're not looking close enough, Melody insisted, reaching for the card. Wrong. He took the card and looked at it again. I'm looking closer than you think, and everything I see is perfect. <gasps> wow. <laughs> <laughs> Melody's throat cyclone, wow, was building strength. Traveling due south, it was headed straight for her stomach. The heat in the house mingled with the heat in her body, and she was being drawn toward him. We should probably kiss now, she blurted, shocking herself. <laughs> I mean, honestly, probably me too when I get to that point. I agree, he said, stepping toward her. The salty, sweet smell of his skin filled her like kettle corn never could. <laughs> closer. 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 And... STAND BACK! shouted a frantic woman. Jackson pulled away. What was that? My homeless mom. <laughs> Can this thing about Jackson thinking her parents are homeless be a running gag throughout the entire series? Because that would be great. That was Melody's mom who yelled, and she was yelling because she believes that she and her father are being chased by a giant timber wolf. Glory, I'm telling you, it wasn't a wolf, Bo reasoned. I, I hate her parents, but they do have good banter. Hey, do you want to go to the September semi with me? Jackson asked. Totally, Melody smiled. But only if I can wear this. Melody struck a pose in her pajama dress ensemble. Perfect, he laughed. Melody stepped closer. Jackson stepped closer. And there it is, Glory screamed. Where? Bo chuckled. I don't see anything. 
Melody, come down here and tell me if you see anything, Glory called. Jackson slips out the front door while Melody walks out the back of the house. Melody goes to see her parents, and she's like, I actually feel beautiful for once because someone likes me. Yay! And this isn't a sign of poor self-esteem that I need someone else's validation to make me feel like myself. Chapter 12, R.I.P. Frankie is her uh, the words, Molly. Frankie is getting recharged from her long walk in the rain, and like her body feels like super dead, but her mind is like running with panic. We find out that Frankie lied to her parents because remember she went to the spa, but she told her parents that they were going to the library. So uh, Frankie tells her parents that her friends wanted to go to the movies after they went to the library, but Frankie came home because her parent, she knew her parents would be worried and she didn't want her friends to be late by having to stop and drop her off. While her parents assumed, worried, tended, stitched, and listened to the local news, Frankie struggled to get back to that imaginary beach where she and Brett were running freely. She finally arrived, but it was raining. We love symbolism, guys. Frankie is imagining how she's going to explain her disappearance to the girls, Lying to her parents about the spa truck was one thing, but how does a human electrical outlet sell the old dead phone battery excuse? It would definitely take some practice. Hoot hoot. Frankie switched off the car off Carmen Electra and lifted her head. Hoot hoot. Either there was an owl in the house or her parents were experimenting with ringtones. <laughs> I cannot understate how relatable that is. It turns out that her parents are experimenting with ringtones, and her parents just got a late night call, and they, they're like, Frankie, you need to get dressed and go, like, now. Now? Frankie glanced at her phone. It's four in the morning. Viveka zipped the hoodie of her black, juicy tracksuit, her tiny bolts momentarily exposed. We're leaving in three minutes. It takes me at least a half hour to put on my makeup, and forget the makeup, long sleeves and a hood should be fine. Her parents, like, aren't telling her where they're going until, like, they get in the car. We have a meeting, Vivica said. Eyes thick, don't thick, uh, the bed, the bed, the bed, the bed. We have a meeting, Vivica said, a slight hint of worry in her voice. At the university? A different kind of meeting, Victor said, eyes fixed on the red taillights of the black Prius ahead. Considering the early hour, a surprising number of cars were headed up Radcliffe Way. Frankie, Viveka turned to face her. Remember we told you there were other people like us in Salem? The RADs? Exactly. When something happens in our community, we get together and discuss it. And something happened? Frankie asked, lowering the window and welcoming the cool night air. Viveka nodded. Wasn't me? Viveka nodded again. Frankie sparked. What are they going to do to me? Nothing, Viveka assured her. No one knows it was you. And no one ever will, Victor insisted. You'll like our get-togethers. While the grown-ups talk, the kids get to mix and mingle with the other RIDs, Rebecca explained. A tangle filled Frankie's heart space. I'll get to meet other RIDs. Brett! 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 <laughs> Apparently Frankie just has a propensity for chanting random things in her head. <laughs> Apparently the youth counselor for the RIDs is Ms. J, the, the science teacher, and, and also Jackson's mom. The Steins get out of the car. And, uh, a man appeared dressed in all black. Without a word, he took Victor's keys and drove off with their car. <laughs> and Frankie's like, what? And Victor's like, he's just parking us for it, it's fine. And he's just parking it for us, it's fine. And Frankie's just like, okay, Jesus, you gave me a heart attack. <laughs> Follow me. Victor offered his hands and led his girls behind a dense thicket. Aw, he refers to them as his girls, that's cute. After a quick scan of his surroundings, he bent down and patted the wet grass. Got it, he said, yanking something that looked like a rusty bangle. A hatch opened, and he hurried Frankie and Rebecca inside. What is this? Frankie asked, marveling at the underground walkway that snaked before them, laid with cobblestone and lit by lanterns that smelled like mud and danger. It leads to R.I.P., Victor's voice echoed. R.A.D. Intel Party. Wait, so it's an acronym within an- It's an acronym with an acronym inside it. Okay. Frankie beamed. So it's a party? It can be, Victor winked at his wife. Viveka giggled. Victor and Viveka are so cute, guys. If anything ha- it, they do not deserve to, ha to be hurt, and if anything happens to them in the story, I will fight someone in a Denny's parking lot at 3 in the morning. Low-key, I don't even know if there's, like, a 
Denny's near me, so like I don't think I even could do that if I wanted to. The low drone of cars on the road above them vibrated throughout the tunnel, but Frankie didn't spark once. Filled with the hope of seeing Brett, she followed her parents along the cobblestone road with the bounce and promise of a day at Disneyland. This girl has fallen so hard for him, and literally all because he said a goofy thing in class, and he wore a shirt with a picture of her grandfather on it. I get that Frankie is naive, and she does strike me as the type of person who would fall, like, really hard in love, so, like... I'm not mad at the offer, I'm mad at the character. That's that's how you can tell a sign of good writing, when you're mad at the character for being dumb, not for the offer for being dumb. An old wooden door with thick iron hinges greeted them at, greeted them at the end of their brief trek. We're here, Victor whispered. Mmm, smells like popcorn, Frankie rubbed her belly. That's because we're under Mel's popcorn stand, Vivecca explained while Victor searched for his key, and soon we'll be underneath the carousel. Voltage, Frankie looked up, but all she saw was a mud ceiling and some broken lantern hooks. The carousel was built by RADs, you know, Vivecca announced with pride. A very nice Greek couple who used to live on a horse farm named Mr. and Mrs. Gorgon. I believe their son Deuce is in their grade. Cleo's boyfriend? Does she know he's an RID? The Gorgons can turn things to stone just by looking at them, Vivecca continued. So one day, Maddie Gorgon hears an uproar in the stable. Turns out one of the groomer's kids was throwing rocks at a nearby beehive and broke it. So when Maddie runs in, she's attacked and starts sliding like mad. Her glasses fall off, she looks at the horses, and just like that, she snapped her fingers. I can't snap, that's why there's no sound. I'm sorry. They turn to stone. The Gorgons spend the next five years painting the horses. Vivecca gasped at the sheer magnitude of the project. And in 1991, Mrs. Gorgon donated them to the city. She giggled. Oh, you should really hear her tell it. It's so funny. So, it's nice to know that the carousel in this town, when children go to ride on it, they're riding on actual deceased living creatures. Click. Victor opened the door to her new social life. Frankie, you are so dramatic. Remember, Victor warned, and here we're family, but up there, he pointed at the carousel, any mention of RAP or its mem members is for- did I say R-A-P? It's R-I-P. Any mention of R-I-P or its members is forbidden, even in an RAD's only conversation, and that includes emails, texts, and tweets. Okay, I get it. Frankie pushed her father inside the round room and did a quick scan for Brett. Wow, Frankie, being very cavalier about the safety of your frickin' race. All around, there's just a bunch of kids in pajamas just sitting around, and the entire, like, basement has a casing of smooth white stone, so, uh, apparently, uh, the horse thing wasn't the only time that Mrs. Gorgon lost her glasses. A woman approaches Victor and Vivecca. Her white linen pantsuit looked surprisingly chic, despite its Labor Day expiration date. Maddie Gorgon, meet our daughter, Frankie, the Becca said, beaming. Maddie clapped her hands over her mouth. Oh, V, she's just gorgeous. Victor did a wonderful job. Frankie practically floated up off the cobblestones with delight. She was completely green, and someone thought she was gorgeous, other than her parents. That's actually cute. That's actually precious. Sweet. Frankie is baby. Like, she's an idiot, but she's also baby. We stand. Nice to meet you, Mrs. Gorgon. Frankie held out her hand, not the least bit concerned about sparking. Call me Maddie, she insisted, or mother-in-law. She leaned closer to Frankie's ear and whispered, If Deuce ever dumps Cleo, I'm calling you. She tapped one of her dark lenses and said, Wink, wink. <laughs> There's another reference to a, a song that's playing, so hold, hold on. This is Bust Your Windows from the Glee soundtrack. I love it. This is dope. I love it so much. This is awesome. I love it. Okay, I listened to some more of it and I really like the melody and how it's got like undertones of classical music. Like we love that and the whoever the girl singing this is straight up slaying it. We love. But I don't like how the melody is kind of like repetitive. It would be a good song for, like, playing in the background at a party, like, what is happening in the book, but I don't know if I would be able to, like, intensely listen to it. I don't know, maybe there's, like, a bridge that gets better. Hold on, let me skip further in the video. Update, no, the melody never gets more interesting, but you know what? 
it's cool for what it is. I think I like the song. It's very cool. I'm a, I actually want to look up the actual version now, because from my experience, Glee butchers everything. But maybe not in this case, because the girl singing it was really cool. She had like a very like soulful soprano voice, which is something that is very hard to pull off. So props to whoever the heck was singing that, because she was doing a good job. Okay, so that song starts playing, and everyone shot up to dance. From what she could tell, no one else had seams or bolts, but there were a few guys with snakes for hair, a guild couple making out by the stone cactus, several swinging tails, and a serpent-skinned girl who resembled the voltage Fendi clutch Frankie had seen in Vogue. <laughs> Frankie, no. <laughs> No, honey. So Frankie hears someone calling to her, and she turns around, and Lala is there. And she mentions that, oh, I heard a little while ago that your dad was making a kid. I just didn't know she'd be so voltage. Frankie delighted at the sound of her own expression. So you knew when we went to the spa? I had a feeling. We all did, Lala confessed. But we're not allowed to talk about R.A.D. stuff out there, so we've been waiting for the next R.I.P. to confirm. Well, consider me confirmed, Frankie smiled brightly, luxuriating in the weightlessness of freedom. Um, what are you? She blurted, unsure of the polite way to ask, or if there even was one. Lala took a step back, placed her hands squarely on her hips, and smiled. Pink and black hair, black satin pajamas covered in pink bats, cashmere scarf and gloves, dark eyes, mascara foot smudges on her forehead. It all looked completely Lala. I don't know, Frankie shrugged. Look! Lala smiled wider for a photographer who wasn't there. Fangs! Frankie shouted over the music. You have fangs! That's why you always laugh with your mouth closed. Frankie's like, oh, this is so cool! And then she hears another familiar voice. Good day, mates! Blue called, spritzing her scaly bare arms with the spa's Evian facial mist. Her forearms were spiked with triangular growths that looked like fins, and her fingers and toes were webbed. How does she write? I have, a, I have questions. Confirmed? Lala lifted Frankie's arm and pointed at her seams. Ice! The fins wiggled with delight. Welcome to the party! Have you, are you all enjoying the return of my terrible Australian accent? Ooh! Cleo yawned, shuffling toward them. Other than her feet, which were clad in a pair of gold platform sandals, and her ring-covered hands, she was totally wrapped in strips of white cloth. The fashion-forward look was so Rihanna at the 2009 American Music Awards. Well, I have no idea what Rihanna looked like at the 2009 American Music Awards, because I am a teenager reading this book in 2020. Good job at dating your book. We, we approve. Does anyone know what's going on? Was there another sighting? Lala shrugged. Is he here? Cleo asked. Lala pointed at the free boys seated on a stone carpet in front of them. Deuce appeared to be in a meditative state, sitting cross-legged and wearing sunglasses. He was playing the flute. Aw, he plays the flute. That's adorable. For the tangle of green snakes slithering on his head. Looks like someone's having an R.A.D. hair day. <laughs> I shouldn't have laughed at that, but I did. <laughs> I can't believe you're here too, Frankie exclaimed, inhaling a nose full of amber perfume. I would say the same thing about you, only I'm not the least bit surprised, Cleo said smugly. Now pay up. Huh? Not you, Draculaura, she snapped, her tired blue eyes smoked to perfection. I told that vamp that you were one of the first time I laid eyes on you. Now she owes me ten bucks. Who's Draculaura? It's my R.A.D. name. My real name, Lala said, handing Cleo a $10 bill. They, they just had to establish that because the author realized that it would be weird if, Dra if, her, if her name was just Draculaura when she went to school. But then instead of shortening it to Laura like a normal person would do, she decided to go with Lala. I guess Lala is like more like pastel gothy, but like... I don't understand why they didn't just shorten it to Laura. There's some more banter. I'm not going to read it to you. Uh, the door slammed. Everyone turned to find a pack of preppy, albeit hairy, boys entering the party, their long fingers clutching supersized McDonald's takeout bags. Without a single word, they sat at the stone picnic that picnic table? Is that what I was about to say? <laughs> the stone picnic table and began devouring their Big Macs. Claude, Cleo shouted at the oldest looking boy who had dark curly hair and was dressed in khakis and a blue blazer. Where's your sister? In the tunnel crying. <laughs> I love how he just says that emotionally, like he doesn't care. What am I supposed to do? Claudine entered, sobbing. Look what they did to me. She tugged the patch of red fur around her neck. What happened? Cleo patted, patted her arm. It was those PETA activists again. They think I'm wearing fur. 
You are, Frankie reasoned. Yeah, Claudine unbuttoned her navy blue coat and revealed her amber one. My own. Frankie gasped in horror, not from the shock of seeing werewolf hair under his sexy night. What? What is this word choice, Frankie? Frankie, you got you got something you want to tell us? As much as from the memory of suggesting Claudine remove her fur, if only she had known. Ugh, the wolf growled. If the stupid power didn't go out yesterday, I would have gotten my wax and none of this would have happened. Frankie sat on the arm, on the arm of a nearby couch and pretended to pick a loose ankle seam, so uh, just everything Frankie does is just upsetting Claudine in this book and I kind of love it. They explain that the reason Lala constantly has makeup smeared all over her face is because she can't see her reflection because she's a vampire so she has to try and do her makeup just by, like, feel. Hey, what's she doing here? Claudine asked, suddenly noticing the newcomer. Frankie pointed to her bolts. Oh, cool. Claudine sat, unfazed, as if she pierced necks at the mall for a living. <laughs> Frankie noticed embroidery on the nightie. It said Claudine, but like the claw Claudine instead of the normal Claudine. Oh, she said, pointing. Is that how you spell your name? It's cool. Claudine looked down. That's how my parents spell it, but at school it's just easier to go with the normie spelling. Fewer annoying comments. Ms. J enters the room and, uh, Frankie is like, what about Brett? Because he's not in the room. Frankie let out a heavy sigh. He wasn't coming. He wasn't like her. He wasn't an option. Ms. J shut off the stereo and everyone sat like in a game of musical chairs. Sorry I'm late, Ms. J announced. Car trouble. Yeah, remind me to use that one next time I'm late for biology, Claude barked. Everyone chuckled. You need to get your license first, she fired back. Ooh, Ms. J roasting some people. Eleven days, Claude announced. <laughs> Why did I say that with the tone of, like, the seven days from the ring? The RIDs applauded. Why are we- I don't care if Claude's getting his license. Like, I don't- Why are- Why is everyone applauding? I don't care. <laughs> Frankie studied Ms. J with renewed interest. Woody Allen glasses, a sharp black bob, red lipstick, and a collection of pencil skirts and blouses in varying shades of black made her interesting for a teacher. But as an RID, she lacked pizzazz. What's she in for? Frankie whispered to Lala. She's a normie, but her son is an R.A.V., only he doesn't know. She thinks not knowing will protect him. Is it Brett? Frankie whispered excitedly. Frank Frankie, no. Hardly. Lala feigned a swoon. Ms. J introduces Frankie to all of the other I.D.s. And then she's like, as you know, there was an R.A.D. signing on Mount Hood High last week. I'm guessing it was a prank, but the normies are taking it very seriously. Several are staying indoors, and then Claudine's brothers start howling and stomping. I'm not going to imitate it because I'm trying to be quiet right now. He- oh, Miss J snapped. <laughs> I love that the Wolf Brothers can just be tamed by a heel. My point is, we need to exercise extreme caution until this blows over. Normie interaction should be kept friendly but distant. Cleo's hand shut up. Miss J, when you say distance, does that mean no kissing Melodork? Is she a normie? Cleo nodded. The teacher removed her glasses and shot Cleo and are you seriously asking me that glance? That's like the look that uh, teachers give you when you like are spacing out and thinking about something so then you ask so then you ask a question and it turns out they they literally answered it five seconds ago but you were like thinking about like ace attorney or something. <laughs> Deuce stands up and is like Cleo can you just let this go? Good god I only love you. Cleo's thick, possibly false, lashes fluttered. It seems like everyone these days is wearing false eyelashes and it stresses me out. I don't know why it stresses me out, it just does. I know, I just wanted to hear you say it in front of everyone. Anyway, she doesn't like you, she likes Jackson. Everyone giggled except Ms. J, and Frankie, who couldn't help wondering why the boys fought Melody with so voltage, because she sounded like nothing more than a boyfriend stealer. Are you through, Cleo? said Ms. J. That depends, she fixed her gaze back on Deuce. Are you? Deuce nodded and then blew Cleo a kiss. Cleo blew one back. Deuce sat down on the stone carpet. He put on his headphones and the snakes settled immediately. Cleo smirked at Ms. J. Now I'm through. If everyone is through, then I'd like to move on to something a little more pressing. Ms. J stood and pushed back the puffy sleeves of her black blouse. It came to my attention during our Friday staff meeting that this year's September semi is going to have a theme. Blue raised her webbed hand. Under the sea? <laughs> Why is everyone in this book such a hopeful idiot? Is is this how we come across to adults? Is It might be. Not gonna lie, it might be. I'm afraid not, Laguna Blue, Ms. J said sadly. In sight of the alleged monster sighting, they think it would be festive to make it a 
a... She inhaled deeply, then exhaled. Monster mash. The reaction was so explosive, Frankie imagined the carousel popping off its hinges and spiraling down Front Street. And then there was, like, a bunch of reactions from the students, but I'm not gonna read them. One thing that bothers me is I was like, oh, they call it a September semi because they're too extra to have a homecoming dance. But, like, if you want to go with the monster plotline, then why not just make it a Halloween dance? Like, I don't understand why she had to make up a fictional dance with the stupidest sound and sound with the stupidest sounding name in the world. Frankie stands up in the crowd and she's like, I think the Monster Mash theme is a good thing. I think Normie's wanting to dress like us is a compliment. Isn't imitation the best form of flattery? I mean, who isn't tired of copying their style? Maybe it's a sign of the times. Maybe normies are ready for change. Maybe they need us to show them they don't have to be afraid. And maybe the best way to do that is to go to the Monster Mash without costumes. I, oh, Frankie, you're so naive and adorable, and I don't know how I feel about you anymore. What exactly are you suggesting? Ms. J asked. Frankie tugged at her neck seam. Um, I, I guess I'm saying a costume party with a monster theme means we can go as ourselves. Then once everyone is having a good time, we can show the normies that we're not in costume. They'll realize we're harmless and we'll be able to live freely and openly. The room was silent. I could finally let my hair down, Deuce joked. I could take off this ridiculous blazer, Claude said. I could smile for pictures, Lala announced. It doesn't matter, Cleo grinned. It's not like you show up on film anyway. Lala bared her things. Thanks. Cleo rolled her eyes. Then they both giggled. Okay, two things about what was just said. Number one, so you're telling me that Deuce, this Deuce, this poor boy has to live with snakes on his head all day and he has to, like, keep them from hissing in glass? I actually feel bad for Deuce. Like, his life sounds like it sucks. And second of all, La uh, Cleo says that Lala doesn't show up on film. What about digital pictures? Does that still apply? Could Why can't vampires show up in pictures anyway? It can someone who knows more about vampiric lore assist me? Because I, I genuinely have no idea why that's a trope. How about we put it to a vote, Ms. J said. All in favor of coming out of the casket during the September semi, raise your hand. Frankie's arm shot up. Hers was the only one. All in favor of staying hidden? Everyone else raised an arm. Ms. J raised two. Really? Frankie sat, unable to make eye contact with anyone. Not that they were trying. Disappointment and shame fought inside Frankie for heart space domination, but total depression came out of nowhere and stole the title. Obligatory, relatable humor. Why was everyone so afraid? How would things ever change if they didn't take a chance? Will I ever dance on the beach with Brett? Yes, because the only reason Frankie's fighting for civil rights isn't to ensure uh, rights and opportunities for herself and her friends and her family. It's because she wants to date a boy. Or at least that's what Frankie's priorities in this scene make it seem like it is. We know that it isn't because before she even met Brett, Frankie was wondering why do we have to stay hidden, but the, the way the writing is done make it sounds like she's just doing it for Brett, and that's, um, questionable. It's settled then, Ms. J announced. Forty-three to one. Two, said a boy's voice. Frankie searched the room for her only supporter, but saw no one. Over here, said a floating sticker hovering above her. The sticker read, hello, my name is Billy. Hey, I just wanted to let you know you've had my vote. Voltage, Frankie said, trying to sound enthused by her invisible brother in arms. What are we going to do? Miss J shouted. Hide with pride! Everyone shouted back. Everyone but Frankie. And that is going to be it for the Monster High reread. I find it interesting how they're starting to say, like, coming out of the casket and hide with pride. It sounds like they're trying to invoke, like, um, like, uh, references to queer rights, although that might just be me projecting onto it since I live in a different time, and, like, it, queer rights weren't super addressed in mainstream media, not until, like, Lady Gaga had, like, Born This Way happen. <laughs> that reminds me of a Tumblr joke that said that when Born This Way was released, all the gays just, like, sprouted out of the ground. <laughs> anyway, moving on. That's the end of the Monster High reread for right now. Abby, I will see you on Friday.